Um, thanks for the introduction. Yes, we know each other for quite many years. <laughs> Okay, now uh, we hear about healing spaces. Now I'm going to bring you through um, uh, stories of patients where you hear about uh, healing their beings. Okay, so the topic that I'm going to talk about today is going to be moving beyond service to provide a unique experience. Now Jane is a 20 years old uh, young lady who came through our emergency department and she was in fear. She was uh, abused by her boyfriend, and not once, but a um, number of times. Jane was an adopted child, and she has very, very limited family support. So um, it was a crisis for her, and it was also a crisis for our department. Why? Because her boyfriend followed her to the emergency, to our department. A few times we have to call the security to bring him out. He was also very disruptive and almost pick a fight with the other patients in our department when we tried to send, send him off the, uh, our department. We needed to keep Jane safe. Right? So we have a number of social workers attending to one to boyfriend and security guards and one with Jane talking with her, planning, making plans of safety. Um, and another back end calling a number of crisis shelters of where we could hide her. So eventually we found a place to shelter her and we needed to get the boyfriend out, right? So how? We called the police and the police said, no, 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 it's not our job to bring the patient to safety. <laughs> so it was, we, we didn't know what to do and then uh, we realised that, oh, maybe we can call our hospital transport, our ambulance. And we were so glad that the ambulance, after hearing the story, immediately said yes we will bring Jane to safety. Right? So we have to secretly hide her, um, went with her through the back end of our you know, ED department, hide her in ED while somebody attended to the, uh, the boyfriend and, um, and our ambulance sent her to safety to another shelter. And it was not all. Okay? So then the next day, because of fear and, and a lot of worry, Jane somehow discharged herself from safety. She became unsafe again and she also realised that her boyfriend was uh, someone who cannot, whom he, uh, she cannot rely on and finally she called us back again after her discharge from the sh uh, shelter. Then we had to find another shelter for her. So it was not just a safety for her once but twice. So through this experience, the worker as well as the whole hospital team, you know, even the doctors uh, coordinated with us gave us a space to, to, host, uh, to hide her until the ambulance came forward to bring her to safety. So it was the whole medical team that gave and provided Jane that experience of safety. Right? So this is about Jane. Next, I have a story about uh, Mr. Tan. Uh, Mr. Tan is a 50 years old man um, who is uh, having some uh, arthritis problem and also following up with a renal clinic. Okay? Uh, he collects and sells cardboard for a living. And he has been on assistance, uh, financial assistance on, uh, for his medical bills, for his uh, daily expenses. And one day he came forward and said, you know, I don't have money to, to, to pay for my transport for, um, for my medical appointment. So we started to help him with uh, some small money for, to pay for his bus fare, MRT fares. Then the social re workers realised that, oh no, no, this is not going anywhere. You know, um, there's some reliance and quite a bit of reliance on former financial support. And that resulted, somehow resulted in his loss of control in life. And the social worker decided, okay, let's try this. Let's do goal setting. And both of them agreed that, okay, we should uh, start looking at savings. Savings of 20 cents per day okay, to help me cope with my bus fare and MRT fare. So I'll know that I'll need to come uh, to the hospital medical appointment uh, next month, so I'll start saving for my bus fare. And you know how long it took to motivate him, to encourage him to do it? It was about one year effort. <laughs> yes, and we persevere. We persevere and encourage him, motivated him, and the day he saved that amount, he proudly came to the social anchor and said, I saved the amount to pay for my bus fare. And he is starting to gain back control in his life to be able to better manage his medical situations and his financial situation. So this is Mr. Tan. 
Next, we have um, Ben, who is 41 years old, who passed away uh, quite recently from cancer. Uh, he was uh, he's married with a young daughter, and like what Dr. Lee say, pain pain is not just physical pain. There's a lot of multi-dimensional pain in his life. As a young person with this child, and his hope of seeing the child grown up, maybe you know, may not be able to be materialized. So um, the social workers, not just the social worker, but the whole team, the whole palliative care team, um, came together and did a lot, a lot, a lot of work with. Uh, with Ben, his daughter, and his wife. So we have sessions with uh, the child on play therapy, you know, getting her to express um, what is it like for her to be journeying with his, uh, her father in this uh, situation. Um, sitting with Ben for a number, number of times to just talk about his life. And eventually, the outcome is um, they made a, a tape for him and he decided that he would do another tape for his colleagues. He used to work as a teacher. So uh, he made two tapes, one for the family and one for his colleagues to leave a legacy behind. And he told the medical team, um, dying alone would be a tragedy, but I'm so glad that I don't have to fight this on my own. I'm very grateful to have a team of people to care and support me from the depth of my heart. Thank you. He also wrote in a thank you letter to appreciate all the medical team for their work. And for the wife and child, this whole work together with the family actually helped them create a meaning of grief. Now the family is able to give meaning to that grief and able to move on in their life. They still remember him, they still miss him, and they still talk a lot about him. But the family has a new meaning in grief because of all this work done with patient and them together. So that is Ben. Okay. I have, uh, we have another patient, Alan, in his uh, early 30s. Um, Alan is diagnosed with HIV AIDS. And um, he was perceived as complicated, difficult, and you know, just non adherence to treatment. Um, so when the worker started to uh, sit with him and talk through about his um, uh, um, challenges, um, she, she started to also feel that, oh, is this what really he's going through or is it just exaggerating? And then um, after a while, it didn't go anywhere. And finally, she de decided that, okay, I should remove all my preconceived notion. Okay, everything about Ellen. Let's start fresh. And that was the moment. That was the moment that allowed Ellen the space for inner disclosure. And he started to talk about his past, his hurts, his pains, his losses, and what made him who he is now. Okay. And that allowed the worker and the medical team to have a new understanding of him and to have a new level of empathy for him. And this translated to um, easier engagement when they talk about barriers to treatment. So they are now able to openly talk about what are the barriers to treat treatment and he's now able to manage the treatment part of it. And for him, um, the worker actually described him as uh, being um, like a puzzle, you know, trying to piece together his life and sometimes it's very abstract. So for him, the impact that was created from this experience was that he's also able to start to piece the puzzle within himself. So that is Ellen. And finally, we have a, a city, uh, 28 years old, who was admitted for a major depression and some trauma work. Uh, she was being molested. Um, she has very mild mental retardation, very mild only, was still able to make sense. Okay. Siti um, had very bad relationship with the parents. Um, even though with bad relationship, she was the only child who decided to stay with the parents when other siblings have moved out. But Siti also had um, a kind of very um, difficult behaviors. She attempted to run away from home a number of times and uh, parents uh, did not know how to manage and uh, the understanding was not there. Right? And when the worker started to work with him, again, this is not just the social worker alone, but the psychiatric team, you know, the whole team started to work with her and the mother. The first time that the team met her, she could not talk. 
there was a block, a mental block. Somehow she could not talk. She can talk, but then she cannot talk. You know, so she started to write. So the team would ask her question, and she would write simple things, and she can write. So that was how they started to communicate. You know, then by pacing with her, giving that space to be safe. Again, we are talking about the experience of safety because her trauma of being molested is is very difficult. So giving her the space of safety, finally one day she uttered her first word, a yes to a question. So that was the beginning of more conversation, more in-depth conversation. She, and she started to share that how she felt she was not wanted by them, how she was born with deformities and how, the, how she felt that the parents uh, 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 favours the other siblings over her. Uh, so the psychiatrist, the social worker, work with her and um, they talk about safety at home and suggested um, Aukang Care Centre where um, she can build her social skills and they did a home visit to then realise that actually uh, when she was running away from home, she was staying with a godfather and that kind of environment was quite um, complex, you know. So um, she also decided that yeah, maybe a, a residential place where she could get some support might be good for her. So eventually, the mother eventually agreed and even accompanied her for the assessment at Aukang Care Centre. So she was accepted there and she learned social skills and she learned and she gained her confidence. And she told the team that now she realized that there are people who are nice and who wants to support her. And it came to a point where she's now placed uh, outside for employment. She's working as uh, in McDonald's. So it was a, a successful journey for her. And um, the team saw her from being a very traumatized young lady to now uh, a lady who can express her views, who can share her aspiration, and who, who wanted to, um, to, to continue her studies in English and math, you know, to better herself. So that is the story of City. Now, all these five stories that I'm telling you, and, and there are a lot more other stories of a uh, um, uh, good outcome. Uh, um, okay, uh, I want to leave you with this concept of N equals to one, okay? Now, how many times would you experience the death of your mother? It's not a trick question. It's a very straightforward question. <laughs> how many times would you experience the death of your mother? Once. How many times would you experience the death of your elder brother? Eldest brother, if you have one. One, right? How many times would you experience the death of your maternal grandmother? One, right? Yes, and that is one. Okay, many times when we work in healthcare, we sometimes uh, forget that N is equal to one. We forget that that patient we are looking after, that person we are looking after is the one mother of this child, is the one brother of this sister, and is this one grandfather of this grandson. Okay, so if we are able to take back the concept of N equals to one, the, uh, really appreciate the uniqueness of each individual, and then we will be able to create an experience where new mindsets can be formed and new mindsets can be challenged and change could happen. Right? And it's only then that our experience, you know, our healthcare workers' experience would also be changed if we take the concept of N equals to one. Okay, so I leave you with this. Thank you.